right. Good morning, everybody. All right. Um, so uh, we're going to continue today in our series in uh, Joshua chapter 9. We're going to be in today, if you have your Bibles. Um, Pastor Michael's not here, obviously, uh, today. <laughs> and so, but uh, don't worry, he's, he's, he's going to come back in uh, some time. But so, <laughs> I mean, you're like, well, where's he going? I mean, um, so he's not here, but uh, so I'm here today. And um, I just wanted to, we're going to get into Joshua chapter 9. But uh, let, me t- let me start out telling you a little bit. Um, when, I, when I was early in my ministry years, I was a young uh, missions pastor. I had I was on the mission field for a couple years, and our, the church that had sent me on the mission field brought me back to be one of the missions pastors. And I was pretty young, and I had been probably doing this mission pastor thing for about two years, and, and I felt like I was doing okay at it, you know? I felt like I was doing pretty good. I felt like God was blessing the, the work and things like that, and I had this opportunity come up. There was a guy in our church, very prominent guy in our church, big church, and a very prominent guy that he ran this foundation that, that kind of gave money to different missions organizations. And this guy had been all over the world. He'd even been to North Korea, even everywhere. And he was well known, and, and all the missions people were like, man, this guy, he's a great guy, by the way, too, godly man. And he wanted to go uh, um, to Honduras, where I had been as a missionary. We were partnering, at, at our church was partnering with them to see kind of some stuff there and talk to the people. And they asked me to take him. They asked me to take his name is Otis. This is funny. You wouldn't think the prominent guy in your, if your name's Otis, I'm sorry. But the prominent guy in your church is named Otis. But um, his name was Otis. And to take Otis to, to Honduras, and, and, and I'm like, wow, you know, I get to take this prominent guy. This is an opportunity for me. I started out pretty wrong. This is an opportunity for me to help Otis see that I'm a, I'm a capable young man. You know, I'm, I'm doing good here. I, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to get to translate for him. I'm going to take him to my old stomping grounds. I know all the people there. I know where to go. This is going to be great. So one of the things about me when I'm going on a mission trip, I usually don't pack till the night before pretty late. And I, if you know me, you're probably not surprised. But anyway, so... The night before the trip, I'm packing my stuff to go. And it's easy because I, you know, I was a missionary there. It's no problem. I know what I need to bring. And when I was done packing, I was getting kind of tired. We had to leave real early. I had to meet him at 4.30 the next morning at the church. <clears throat> and um, I was like, you know, I was kind of prompted in my heart, you know, Glenn, you should take some time to pray. You should take some time to pray right now. And I'm, I'm not proud of this part of the story, but I'm not proud of any part of this story, actually. But you'll leave it in one second. I, in my mind, I don't remember exactly. Uh, I think part of it was, I'm good. It, I'm going back to, this is not going to be a hard mission trip for me. This is going to be easy. I'm going to Honduras. I'm going to my old stomping grounds. I'm not taking a whole team of people. Just me and Otis, he travels all the time. We're just going. I'm going to show him around. I'm going to impress him. It's going to be great. And, and, and I'm good. I, I, it's not, this is not really a trip I need to be praying a lot about. And then plus, I'm kind of tired. I think I need to just get some rest. So I know everybody's looking like, are, and you're still allowed to be a pastor and you did that? <laughs> anyway, so I'm not proud of it. It was not right. Please, kids, don't do that. Anyway, but here's the thing. So the next morning I drive, meet Otis at the church. You know, I'm all excited. All right, here it goes. 4.30, it's an hour drive from where we live to the Atlanta airport. We get there. It's a Monday morning. So my goodness, Monday morning in Atlanta. Oh, it's terrible. And, and the lines are everywhere. But Otis and I, we parked the car. And we're walking up to the terminal with our stuff. And Otis looks at me kind of jokingly. He goes, you got your passport, right? Because only a moron would not bring their passport to a mission trip. And I went, of course I got my passport. And I patted my pocket. There's no passport in that pocket. There's no passport in that pocket. And I'm not remembering when I put my passport. I went, looked at Otis. I went, one second. I threw my bag. All right, already I've lost my my competency level just plummeted. And anyway, in, in Otis's eyes, I throw my backpack down. I'm rifling through my backpack. And I look at Otis and I say, dude, oh, I forgot my passport. So no more impressing Otis. That's done. Now it's like, how am I even going to get to Honduras? Hour away, right? It's 530 in the morning. Flight's leaving in two hours. I can't drive back. No. So I have to call my wife, who's seven months pregnant. And has a 19-month-old sleeping. Hi, honey. I miss you so much already. You know, no. 
She, I'm, I'm just so, praise God, she answered the phone. You know, it's 5.30 in the morning. Chrissy, I'm really sorry I got to ask you to do something. What? I forgot my passport. Can you just, just 5.30 in the morning, drive to the Atlanta airport, get Ethan up out of bed, who's 19 months old, and you take yourself in the car, who's seven months pregnant, drive to the Atlanta airport, just give me my passport, and drive back home. No problem, right? She, she did it. My wife is so wonderful. Have I ever told you that? She did. She said, okay, I'm bringing you your passport. I mean, she drove. Yeah, hey, there they go. <laughs> Boys, get a good wife. <laughs> and anyway, one that's full of grace. And so you're going to need it. So she's driving to the airport. I'm, I'm talking around the phone. How close are you? How close are you? She's like, um, it, the traffic's starting to build up. I'm like, go in the HOV lane. She's like, but... I'm just me. I'm like, you got Ethan. That's another person. You know, go, go, go. And so she's going, and um, she coming. I'm coming up to the terminal, and I went out front, and I just ran up next to her. And when she was driving by, because I did not want to, you know, push her any further, I said, just hold the passport out the window. And I see the car coming, she, and I literally run. Hey, grab the passport. I love you so much. Thank you. And I run in to the airport. It's Atlanta, did I tell you, on a Monday morning? So I'm a crazy man. I'm surprised I didn't get shot by Homeland Security. I run in waving my passport in the air. My wife just drove me all the way from Barrow County to bring it. I'm running in front of the whole line at the gate, because this is when you still had to check your luggage in person and everything. And my wife drove all the way to Barrow County. I need to get in front of the line. My plane's leaving in 10 minutes or whatever. I'm screaming. And I run up front. Nobody shot me, and they actually like said oh here here sir let's get you and and they got me through and I, I look and the security line is like two miles long and the the person god just put the right person wait i'll take you i'm gonna get you to the front of the security line and so i get to the front of the security line so otis the guy i'm trying to impress he's waiting to see if i even make it he hadn't boarded the plane yet they're about to shut the gate and what is his seat does he see here's the great capable young missions pastor he sees a goofball holding his shoes in the air running through the terminal in his socks yelling don't shut the gate and i get up there i get on the plane and go and i sat down and looked at otis and there's nothing you can say at that point i just said that's never happened to me he said i bet it hasn't <laughs> so Otis and I are still good friends, by the way. He became a mentor in my life. I somehow redeemed myself, not that trip, but eventually later on in life. Um, but well, why do I tell you this story? Let me tell you, prayerlessness, prayerlessness is going to cost you. It's going to cost you. In my life, so often we don't see that. Now, some people could say, Glenn, maybe if you just packed a little earlier, you may, yeah, maybe, but you know what? I, by the way, I usually do pray before. I, I, it was a more normal practice of me to spend time in prayer before a trip. It was a normal practice of me to spend time in prayer before that. But that time, I just for some reason decided, eh, I'm good. You know, I'm, I, one of the things I always pray is, God, if there's anything I'm forgetting, can you remind me? God, I need your help. And I believe that if I had done that that night, I believe that I would have gone, oh, my passport. You know, I believe that. Now, some people say maybe if you packed earlier, it doesn't matter. But here's the thing. Prayerlessness will always cost you. And so, so pride or complacency can lead us to prayerlessness, which can have difficult consequences on you and others, like your pregnant wife and your 19-month-old child and, and everybody else involved. And in this chapter, we're going to see how neglecting to seek God on a seemingly small issue can lead to not, not so small consequences for the Israelites. So if you have your Bibles, we're in chapter 1. Here's what I'm going to do this. I'm going to talk us through a little bit of this chapter, and we're going to focus on some key verses here that we're going to read. But um, so we know last week we, we talked about Achan and how Achan sinned, and it caused the Israelites to lose a battle against Ai, which was a very small city, a battle they shouldn't have lost. And But eventually God... <clears throat> God redeems them, and they find Achan, they handle the sin, and then they, they, they end up taking Ai, and they're moving forward into the promised land. They, that failure happened, but they're, that God has allowed them to overcome that failure. So what happens in the beginning of, uh, of Joshua chapter 9, in verses 1 through 2, the kings of all the rest of the ites, I'm not going to go through all their names, but all the rest of the ites in the area there, in the, the promised land, the hill country, and the coast right there, they decide we're going to join together. 
We're going to join together, and we're not going to fight these guys alone because they're just taking us out one by one. We're going to join together, and we're going to fight against the Israelites. But there's one group um, we see in verses 3 to 5. The inhabitants of the city of Gibbon, they call them the Gibeonites. In a, it's a, it's a, basically a prominent city of the, of the Hivitites. <clears throat> it's about 20 miles from Gilgal where the Israelites are camping. They decide we're not going to join up. We're not going to try to fight these guys. They devise this scheme to, uh, to try to stay alive. Um, and they did this, by the way, because they were afraid they were going to die because they feared the Israelites' God. And we see, you're going to see that in verse 24, but um, we'll get there. So what they do is pretty funny. They live 20 miles from where their town, their city is 20 miles from where the Israelites are camping. Part of the promised land, obviously neighbors. And so what they do is they, they go get a bunch of old clothes and old wineskins and old food sacks and old sandals. And they get some crusty old bread and they load it all up and they go to Joshua and the Israelites acting like they've just come from instead of like 20 miles, like 200 miles. Like it's taken them two weeks to get there. And when they get there, they say, okay, we're going to go there and, and we're going to try to make a treaty with them. We're going to go and say, uh, hey, wow, look at our old shoes and our old clothes and, and these old wineskins and all this old stuff. It's, it was all brand new when we left. And, and now we're here. Boy, we live so far away. We want to make a treaty with you because we've heard about what you're doing to all these terrible Canaanite people here close to you. And so this is what they, they do. It's, um, it's not honest, but uh, it is what they did. So what I want to do is I want to start reading in verse 9 through 15, and we're going to focus on a particularly one verse in here today. But um, if you all don't mind standing up while we read God's word today, um, I just, this, this, this passage right here has challenged me this week in so many ways, and I'm so excited to share it with you. So it, I'm excited for us to read it in here. So starting in verse 9, says this, they replied to him, your servants have come from a faraway land because of the reputation of the Lord your God. For we have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two Amorite kings beyond the Jordan, King Sihon of Heshbon and King Ad of Bashan, who was in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our land told us, take provisions with you for the journey Go and meet them and say, we are your servants. Please make a treaty with us. And this is where they start lying. This bread of ours was warm when we took it from our houses as food on the day we left to come to you. But see, it's now dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new and we're, we filled them. But see, they are cracked. These clothes and sandals of ours are worn out from the extremely long journey. The men of Israel took some of their provisions but did not seek the Lord's direction. So Joshua established peace with them and made a treaty with them to let them live. And the leaders of the community swore an oath to them. So that's verse 15. You, can, you all can sit down. Let's pray. God, I just pray today that you would challenge us, but you would also encourage us at the same time in this passage. Lord, we want to be a people of prayer. Lord, we want to be a people that seek you. Lord, help us not to fall into the trap in our lives that the Israelites and Joshua fell into here in this passage. Lord, help us to leave here today <clears throat> encouraged, challenged, and excited to talk to you. Not just once a day or before we eat or something like that, but Lord, to talk to you throughout the day about everything, about what's going on in our lives. Lord, we love you, we trust you, and we thank you for the blessing and the gift of prayer. I pray that as we talk about it today, that you're going to use this time to move us forward in our prayer life. In your name we pray, amen. So the verse I want to focus on today is um, verse 14. Verse 14, it says, the men of Israel took some of their provisions. They, they basically examined everything, but they did not seek the Lord's decision. They didn't ask God about it and pray. They didn't seek the Lord's decision. See, the big problem here in this whole chapter is that the Israelites, Joshua and the Israelite leaders, did not pray about this situation. So it leads me to some questions. First, there's two questions right out of the gate here. Why didn't they pray? 
And, and, and when we think about why didn't they pray, I think we have to think about us right now. Why don't we pray sometimes? So the first question, why didn't they pray? Why didn't they pray? You know what? We don't actually know why they didn't pray because it doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say why they didn't pray. Um, and we got to be careful sometimes saying, oh, I know exactly why they didn't pray. Because of no, I wasn't there. I, I, I can't tell you. I, you know, they got the thing on um, the little kids that fly through the time machine and go to Bible times. I don't have one of those at my house, so I, I don't know. Oh, I forget what the name of that show was. But anyway, if they, they might have, it might have been this reason. They thought it was a small thing and it really didn't matter. Some guys traveling in, wanting to make a treaty with us. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Look, we, we've, we've, all this other stuff has happened. This is small potatoes. It's not a huge wall. It's not a river. It's not all these things. It's just a little thing. We'll just handle it ourselves. Maybe they forgot that God was the one who had done everything for them so far. Maybe they were starting to think, hey, man, look at this. We're taking the promised land. Maybe they forgot that every little good thing that has happened, every inch of ground in that promised land had been given to them by God, and it, and it wasn't actually them that was taking it. They were walking through after God took it. Maybe they started to think a little higher than themselves than they should have. Maybe they just thought, <clears throat> don't bother God, we've got this one. Look, we'll just examine the evidence, and we'll figure it out. We're very smart people. Maybe they thought that. I don't know. I don't know why they didn't pray, but I know it was a problem. But the second question, I want to I point us to that and spend a little more time on it here today. <clears throat> why don't we pray? Because I don't know about you, but that story that I told you about my mission trip and not praying, that's not the only time in my life that I've remained prayerless in a time where I should have prayed. And, and maybe, just maybe, I'm not the only one in here, that sometimes we remain prayerless in times when we should be praying. So I thought, as I thought, why don't we pray? Why don't I pray sometimes? I, there's three things that stood out in my mind this week as I prayed and, and thought about this. And I want to share them with you today. Three things that I think keep us from praying. And I think when we identify those things, we can, we can see them. And, and there's some that are going to stand out to each of us. And we can begin to recognize that. And we begin to, to get that lie out of our head. And we're going to pray more when we recognize these things. <clears throat> and the first thing that keeps us from praying, I believe, is this. It's pride. Pride. We often forget the truth about who God is and who we are. Our own pride keeps us from praying. So often in my life, it's my own pride that keeps me from praying. I kind of think that I'm in control. That I'm, and even though I don't know, I, I don't think that, I act that way. Let me read something from Colossians 1, verse 16 and 17. I love this. It's about Jesus. It's uh, Paul's talking about Jesus, and it says this. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. All right, we serve a God that created everything. Everything, by the way, and created it for him and not us. And then verse 17, I love this. It says, he is before all things and by him all things hold together. Sometimes I forget that. Sometimes I think, by God, all the big things hold together. But I've got the little things. I'm holding those together. You know, we are all so much more helpless than we realize. We are all so much more unwise on our own than we realize we, but we think sometimes that, oh, well, I've got this part held together. How many times has, has have someone said, we should pray about this? Oh, we don't need to pray about this. This is just a no-brainer. This is good. Or how many times <clears throat> have, have you been angry with somebody and someone, maybe you should be praying about that. And you're like, oh, no, I don't need to pray about that. They just need to straighten out. They need to pray about that, not me. How many times do we forget that in him all things hold together? See, we can't hold all things together. And I think I've said this phrase to you before in another sermon. 
We can't hold everything together. We weren't created to. It's obvious in the scripture that Jesus holds all things together. We weren't created to hold all things together. But you know what we can do? We can hold on to the one who holds all things together. We can hold on to the one that holds all things together. How do we do that? We do that by communicating with him, by asking him to lead us and guide us and help us. We do that through prayer. It says this in, in Romans 12, 3. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you, you should not think to, or sorry, everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. See, some of us are gifted in here in amazing ways. I'm looking out here. I see some people in here who are amazing teachers. I see some out here who have the gift of hospitality. I see people here who have the gift of administration. I see people who are, who are gifted in so many ways that God has gifted them. But what we have to remember is sometimes when we're gifted really strong in a way, we begin to think that it's us. And we begin to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And we begin to, to lean into ourselves and lean away from God. And we begin to stop talking to him and depending on him like we should. It happens to all of us, and especially those of us, some of those of you who are gifted. I'm not going to just lump myself in there. It sounds prideful. Anyway, but those of you who are gifted. It, it, and here's the thing. Some of us are gifted, but let us not get puffed up and think that our gifts are from ourselves. They're from God, and they're for God. And listen to this. They should lead us to a deeper dependence on God, not independence from God. Those of you out there who are gifted by God, by the way, don't let that gift lead you to independence from God. That's not the point of that gift. It leads you into a deeper dependence on God. And that deeper dependence is going to drive you to communicate and talk to him and pray more consistently in your life. So pride holds us back. But also there's another one that keeps us from praying. It's kind of the opposite almost, and, and it's uh, shame. Shame keeps people from praying. You might be in here, Glenn, Glenn, pride right now in my life, the way my life is going, pride ain't keeping me from praying. It's shame. Glenn, I'm... I'm just, I'm just dealing with a lot of shame. I've done some things I'm not proud of. I, I don't know how, I don't think God would want to talk to me right now. I've heard people say that. I felt that way in the past in my heart sometimes. God doesn't want to talk to me right now. After what I've done, why would he want to talk to me? Let me tell you, that's a lie. That's a lie from Satan. God does want to talk to you. And by the way, God knows you're a sinner. You're not hiding it from him. Said this, I, I, and Pastor Michael said it last week. John, uh, 1 John 1, uh, 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So let's just start there with that baseline. All of us are, are, are sinners. All of us are going to disappoint God in our life. Now, uh, also it says in the Bible that, that, that the one who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all you do. We are sinners striving for holiness. But we're going to miss the mark sometimes. But guess what verse 9 in 1 John chapter 1 says? It says, if we confess our sins, he says, nope, don't want to talk to you right now. No, that's not what it says. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God wants to talk to you. He especially wants to talk to you when you've screwed up. He especially wants you to come to him. And if you come to him and say, God, I have messed up. I, have, I, I am ashamed right now. He's like, come, come here, come here. I want to talk to you. And if you confess that sin, you confess that shame, he, it's, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. Don't let shame stop you from talking to God. That's what Satan wants. He wants to, he's, he's the accuser. He wants to accuse you and keep you away from God. There's two things in the church, I believe, that, that Satan wants us to stop doing more than anything. Praying and telling people about Jesus. 
He, if he can stop us from praying and, and telling people about Jesus, we can come in here every week and we can fill this place up. Nothing's going to happen, but we're just going to fill a room up every week. Satan knows that. That's what he wants to stop. He wants to stop you. He wants to load you up with shame and make you think that God doesn't want to talk to you. Hey, if you're hiding behind, if you're hiding from God today because of shame, if you're not talking to him because of shame, I want you to go home. I want you to read a passage for me. I want you to read Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Times when I've experienced the most shame in my life, I always am in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is the Psalm of David after he, <clears throat> he slept with another man's wife and then he had the husband killed. And he was a big head king, you know, politician. That's pretty normal these days for politicians to do stuff like that. But back then, I think it was not good. <clears throat> um, uh, if you're a politician, I'm sorry, I'm joking. Anyway, so here's the deal. He, he did this, and then he went on and tried to hide it and act like everything was fine. Until a prophet, Nathan, came in his court and told him a story about someone who did the same thing. And David was like, that man should be killed. And Nathan said, you are the man. You are the man. What kind of shame do you think David felt in that moment? And did that shame drive David away from God? No, it drove David to God. Go read Psalm 51. That's a man who is taking his shame to God and asking God to heal him. And guess what? God answered him. And God will do the same thing for you in this room today. Listen, I, I said it during the prayer time, but God demonstrates his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I believe there's someone in here, and that's not like prophetic, or I just believe it because there's a lot of us in here, that somebody in here is ashamed of something and it's been keeping them from talking to God. It's happened to me in my life. And I'm just telling you today, please go to him confess your sin and know that he loves you and he wants to forgive you. <clears throat> Jesus died for sinners so we can have access to God. It says in Romans 8, 1, therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus in here today and you've not been praying because of the shame of some sin in your life, don't believe the, guy, the lie that God doesn't want to talk to you. God wants you to confess your sin and repent. He has gone out of his way to make forgiveness and fellowship with him available to you. Don't let shame stop you. If you aren't, by the way, a follower of Jesus in here today, and shame of what you have done has kept you from approaching God in the initially, the same thing applies to you. God wants you to confess your sin and repent. He has gone out of his way to make forgiveness and fellowship with him available to you, even if you've never talked to him before. <clears throat> Man, that shame, don't, don't let that stop you. But then there's a third one. There's a third one. Complacency. Complacency keeps us from praying. I don't know about you, but so often in my life, complacency will keep me from praying. It says this in a, uh, Romans 12, verses 11 and 12. Do not lack diligence and zeal. Be fervent in the spirit and serve the Lord. And then it says in verse 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, and be persistent in prayer. How do I rejoice in hope and patient in affliction? I do that by being persistent in prayer. Don't lack diligence and zeal. Be fervent in the spirit serve the Lord. So often we serve the Lord on spiritual autopilot. I think the last time I was up here preaching, I talked about how the fact that I never want to let my work for God eclipse my relationship with God. Because it's easy as a pastor, it's easy as a church member, a person serving in the church, it's easy to serve on spiritual autopilot. It's easy to do it. You get, you get in a groove, you get doing stuff, and it just becomes another task or a job for you. It's easy to be complacent and not pray. I'm on spiritual autopilot. It's fine. I got a good course. We're good. Nothing's going to happen. What if, a, yeah, I'll tell you what, if some lightning hits your plane and you just leave it on autopilot, you're going to have some problems. You might have some problems anyway, but you'll have some problems definitely if you leave it on autopilot. You, you can't live your life on spiritual autopilot. 
The Bible says don't do that. It says rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, and be persistent in prayer. It's easy to become complacent and forget to pray just with the busyness of life. So these three things, that's, uh, that's quite, a, quite, a, quite a group of things. But those, there's more, I'm sure, that keep people from praying. Those are the three big ones that stood out to me this week. And I want to, you know, you guys have to go to Connect Group. The next group has to go to lunch at some point, so I can't keep going. I have to go to the next thing. <clears throat> why should they have prayed? Why should they have prayed? And why should we pray? Because I think it's important. Don't just talk about why, you know, the bad stuff. Let's talk about the good stuff. Let's give a good reason. So the first question I can answer, why should they have prayed? I believe if they had gone to God and asked him what to do, that God would have told them. They don't trust these guys. You know, they're, 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 they're tricking you. And God has a history of doing that in the Bible, by the way. He has a history of giving people wisdom who ask for it. He has a history of people that humble themselves and approach God and say, God, I don't know what to do. Please show me. And I will be open to whatever you show me. He has a history of showing them. And I believe that still goes forward today. So I believe if they had a prayed, things might have gone better. They might have figured out what was going on. Because God had done so far all sorts of way bigger, more miraculous things than just figuring out some tricks of some Gibeonites. But then, so why should we pray? What are some reasons? Glenn, give me some good reasons why you've already told me all the things that keep us from praying. Why should I really go and tackle those reasons and get praying? So here's three again, because we're Baptists and we do things three, three points. Anyway, um, and and I thought of these three and I thought they were pretty good too. Um, So prayer is a source of wisdom and guidance. Prayer is a source of wisdom and guidance. We have, a, we have a source. We have a source of wisdom and guidance for everything in our life from the God who created the universe and is holding everything together. And we have access to his wisdom and his guidance. It says this in James chapter 1, verse 5. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. The Bible says if you don't have wisdom, ask God. Who is wisdom? Who created everything and is holding everything together? So asking God for wisdom would have really paid off for Joshua and the Israelites. Things like like godly, how does God do that? Like when I ask for God, give me wisdom. Does he go, Glenn, this is what you need to do. Get your pen and paper. He doesn't always do that. But what he does is he does things like bring godly counsel in my life. He brings a person to my mind that would be great to talk to about that, that has been through that or can help me with that. He, he sometimes directs me to a part of Scripture that speaks right into what I need to talk about or need to know. Sometimes uh, just the Holy Spirit just leads and, and leads me to where I need to go or what I, what I need to do. See, the whole you have things like godly counsel, the Bible, the Holy Spirit guiding us in truth, but prayer helps us realize our need for God's direction in our life, and he prepares our hearts to receive this direction. When we pray, we're saying, God, I need you. My wisdom isn't enough. Yours is enough. Yours is what I need. When you do that, you're preparing your heart to receive the wisdom. You're admitting your need for the wisdom. You're saying, okay, God, I'm humbling myself before you. I need this. That's a huge thing. To receive wisdom, a humble person receives wisdom better than a proud person. Have you ever tried to talk to somebody who thinks they know everything about something they're dead wrong about? It's ridiculous. It's a waste of time almost. But when the person says, you know what? I don't know this, and I need to know. And I'm ready to hear what you have to say even if it's not what I want to hear, even if it's not what I was expecting. That kind of person, I want to talk to that kind of person. That's the kind of person that that God can help with wisdom when we ask, when we ask. So the next one, prayer is a source of joy and thanksgiving, which is God's will for us, by the way. He wants us to be joyful and thankful. I'll tell you where it says that. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18. Rejoice always. Pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ. What's God's will for us in Christ? That we are rejoice, 
and that we give thanks and that we're in prayer. And prayer leads us to rejoice and give thanks. Talking to God and keeping that open communication line all day. Pray constantly. Does that mean we just have to walk around like, oh, Lord, please? No, but <clears throat> Pastor Michael gave a great illustration, I don't know, weeks ago. It was on Instagram, one of those little clips. And he talked about being aware of God's presence. You know, he talked about when they were looking for a car, they picked the car, and all of a sudden they were seeing that same car all the time. It's kind of like that. When I walk around and pray constantly, I'm constantly aware of God's presence. And when I'm constantly aware of God's presence, I don't act like he's not there and ignore him. Have you ever been with someone walking around and they just pretend you're not there and don't talk to you? No, that's weird. If you're, someone, you're like, why are you even wanting me to come along if you're just going to ignore me, you know? And so don't do that to God. Hey, come with me, God. God's like, you, you, can, you can talk. It's okay. We can talk, you know. And, and talk to God. Be aware of his presence throughout the day. Talk to him throughout the day. It doesn't have, you don't have to stop and do all sorts of religious things. <clears throat> so, so it's God's will for us to talk to him regularly about what's going on in our life, big or small, by the way. And we can rejoice and be thankful in all circumstances because the God who's in control and loves us hears our prayers. That should be enough for you to rejoice. God doesn't want you to be worn out and stressed out. He wants you to, to be thankful and joyful. And, and in order to do that, you, we need to be talking to him. We need to be interacting with him. So there's one more. Prayer <clears throat> can defeat worry and anxiety. Anybody here ever deal with worry and anxiety? No, not in this day and age. That's all gone. We've cured that, right? No, everybody, I think, deals with worry and anxiety. It says this in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Woo, I want that peace of God that surpasses all understanding. I want, I want him to guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I want that peace to guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Boy, I long for that some days when I'm stressed out. But it says, how do you do that? Through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, making your requests known to God. Prayer can defeat worry and anxiety. A, a strong, consistent prayer life brings peace to our hearts and minds. Man, that's enough. I, I'm surprised not everybody's praying all the time. If that's, that's true, that's awesome. So when I was a kid, there was a, a, a hymn we sang in church. Um, in my church, we, we sang this hymn. When I was a kid, I didn't really think about it a lot. I'm just like standing there wondering how many verses they were going to sing or count, you know, what page number is this? Where are the Christmas songs? You know, all this stuff. Do, what kids do when they're with the hymn book. <clears throat> but now that I'm older, I, these songs kind of, I remember the words in my head because I heard them so much. And there's this one song, it's called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We used to sing in my church. Some of you are like, the, the younger people in here are like, huh? But you guys that are like older than me or my age, you're like, oh yeah. What a friend. Let me read you this. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. I know some of you might have been nervous. But <laughs> no, no, no. I know what my gifts aren't. Um, <clears throat> what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. There's one more, don't worry, a couple more. Can, <laughs> you're like, well, dude, just getting excited. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I love that, the words in that hymn. I love it. And you know what that tells me? It tells me this. Prayer is not a religious task. It's a gift from a God who loves us. Too often, we make prayer this religious task. Oh, I don't pray enough. When I used to do youth camps with kids, We'd always have these things that, what do you think you need to do 
now that you're going from camp. And if they were already saved and they're already baptized, I need to pray more and read my Bible more. Every, every sheet, you had to write a sheet, like this is what this kid says, he needs to pray more, read my Bible more. I have to pray. Oh, yes, I've got to figure out a time to pray. And you're like, I, we're making prayer this gift from a God of the universe who loves us. We're making it this religious task that we have to march through every day. Oh, we got to remember before we eat, we got to pray. I'm hungry, though. Well, we got to pray. It's just, you just got to do it. No, it's a gift from God. It's a gift from God. Let me give you an example. My kids, I want to communicate with my kids, and I want them to talk to me about their life, not because of some task. You know why I want that? Because I want to help them. I want to hear what's going on in their life so I can help them. I want to protect them from things. I want to celebrate with them. I want to encourage them. But I can only do that if we talk. If we talk to each other. That's how God <coughs> feels about you. I want them to know I care. See, we get to talk to God. It's a gift. It's a get to. It's not a have to. I have a buddy. His name's Brian Smith. And he has this quote that he used to always use with students. He was a youth pastor. It says, if you make your get-tos, have-tos, you won't want to. And I might have said that to you all before, but deal with it. And if you make your get-tos, have-tos, you won't want to. If you make prayer a have-to instead of a get-to, prayer is going to be a task for you. Instead of a gift. Instead of something you're excited about and look forward to. <clears throat> See, prayer is not a burden. It's a benefit. It's a benefit. So we got to finish this out. We got to finish this chapter out. All right. So uh, in verse 16, the Israelites, they find out that they've been lied to. And in verse 17 and 18, the Israelites want, or, <laughs> the Israelites want to attack them, but can't because of the oath they made to the Israelites. And then the rest of the Israelites grumble against the leaders. Why would you make this dumb oath? To these guys, we're supposed to get rid of all the people in the land. And in verse 19 through 21, um, the Israelite leaders decide to make the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers. See, they messed up by not seeking God in their decision, but they realized that not keeping their word to the Gibeonites is not going to make things any better. So they have to keep their word. And in verse 22 and 23, Joshua asked the Gibeonites, why, why? Did you lie to us? And I want to read the answer real quick. It's verse 24 to 26. The Gibeonites answered him, It was clearly communicated to your servants that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land before you. We greatly feared for our lives because of you. This is why we did this. Now, listen to this. Now we are in your hands. Do to us whatever you think is right. This is what Joshua did to them. He rescued them from the Israelites, and he didn't kill them. <clears throat> People talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the God of destruction and, you know, and, and judgment. And the New Testament is the God of mercy and love. Uh-uh. The gospel is through the entire Bible. The gospel is clear through the entire. We see a picture of the gospel here. The Gibeonites, they believe the truth about God, and they asked for mercy and it was given to them. We see that right here. We see a picture of the gospel in the end of this chapter. Let me explain to you that that gospel is the same thing today. God, God wants you, if you're in here today and you're like, man, Glenn, I want to be forgiven. I want to be freed from my shame. This is the reality that God loves you. God loves you. Here's the problem. All have sinned. It says this in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us is a sinner. We're born a sinner. There's nothing we can do on our own to change that. And if you dig down in your soul, you might think, no, I'm not that bad, Glenn. If you really think about it, you're a sinner. We're all sinners. And the Bible says this in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And that death is not just like we're going to die, but it's a eternal separation from God in a real place called hell. People don't like to hear about that, but I'm sorry, I need to tell you or I'd be a jerk, basically. If there's a real place like that that you could go to, and I don't tell you about it, that's bad. So, so your sin results in this separation from God. It says the wages of sin is death, but guess what else it says? It says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus died on a cross for your sin when he did nothing wrong. 
He died the death he didn't deserve to pay the price that you can't pay. And he rose again to prove that he is God and he is who he says he is and he does what he says he's going to do. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, so what does that mean to you? It says, God proves his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You might, I'm a sinner though, Glenn. Well, that's right. He died for you. That's how God proved his love for you, that while you're a sinner, he died for you. You don't have to clean up to get to God. You can't. And it says this in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's nothing you can do on your own. It is saying, I believe the truth about who you are, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I'm a be- I believe I'm a sinner who needs forgiveness from you. And the best way I know how, I'm going to live my life for you. I'm going to live my life as if that is true and everything you say is true. And I'm going to do the best I can to do that and live that way. You might say, well, Glenn, not me. You don't understand. I got so much shame. My shame meter is like broken. It's through the roof. For everyone, it says in Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. So here's the thing. Prayer, all this stuff about prayer, it starts with a relationship with Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, this sermon was kind of great to knowledge, but it doesn't really apply. It starts with a relationship with Jesus. And the only way to experience prayer the way God intended, that's the only way, is a relationship with Jesus. God wants to hear from you, he wants to speak to you, and he's gone out of his way to make it possible. Let's pray. God, we love you, and we thank you so much for who you are. Lord, we thank you for the gift of prayer. Lord, I pray today that we would all examine ourselves, and we would examine and check and say, have we been living in prayerlessness? Are there aspects of our lives that we're we're in prayerlessness? We're good over here, but over here we're not praying. God, I pray that today, if there's any result of this, that we will talk to you more this week. We will recognize our need for you more this week. I pray that there's people here who've who've been just turned away from you and hiding from you because of shame, that they will turn to you this week and they will experience your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy and your love and your joy and your thanksgiving. I pray for those of us who just, we've maybe gotten complacent. We need, to, we need to start praying more. We need to start not running on spiritual autopilot that we would dig in this week to you. I pray for those of us who've been prideful, that we would recognize that, we would confess it to you, and that we would humble ourselves to you. Lord, we love you. We're excited about what you're doing. We're we just thankful that we are not alone, that God really loves us. So Lord, I pray today that no one will leave this room without talking to somebody if they need to talk to them about these things. I pray that we would go out in power this week, in your power and not our own, and that we would be a praying people and we would see you do mighty things as we come to you each day, all throughout the day. It's in your name we pray, amen. All right, real quick, if you today... If you're like, Glenn, I need to talk to somebody about this relationship with God. There are people with this name tag on. Talk to them. It's, not, it, it's a little next steps team. The other thing you can do, you're like, oh, I don't feel like talking to anybody right now. There's a card in your seat back, and there's a place here where you can check. Today I pray to receive Christ as my Savior. I'd like to be baptized. I want to know more about small groups. I have some questions and would like someone to contact me. Fill that out. But thank you for being here today. I love you all. And uh, looking forward to seeing you again next week. You're dismissed. <laughs>